Coming up on Playing the Field, the farewell tour is in high gear for Kobe Bryant. But what does this season mean for the younger players? And the Clippers seem to have found a groove, but without Blake Griffin. How will Doc Rivers make the adjustments when Lob City comes back? The NFL is coming back to LA, but which teams or team will make the City of Angels their home? And speaking of home, the Dodgers named Dave Roberts as their manager, and he's very excited to be back in Dodger Blue. Hello and thanks for joining us. You're watching Playing the Field. I'm Maria Soreo, joined by my NBA expert, Will Lupardis. Will, it's our first show of the new year. I know. Happy New Year, Maria. Happy New Year. And there is so much sports news to talk about here in Los Angeles. Let's get started with, believe it or not, NFL football. It's the big thing right now. We've got the playoffs and we got a lot of big news in Los Angeles, even though we don't have a team. It, we, we don't have a team yet, but here's what we do know. And, and this is going to change hourly, daily, so I'm sure by the time this airs, we'll have more information. But as of right now, the Rams, the Raiders, and the Chargers have all put in uh, for relocation to Los Angeles. And now it's going to be a wait and see game as far as what the NFL says about that. Yeah, I think there is um, a meeting this coming week. Yes, exactly. And um, I think it's after the season the owners will all vote on who will get to relocate like they want to. And um, we don't know if it's going to be one or two, but... I don't think it's going to be three. It won't be three. It'll it probably be two. It should be two. Uh, yeah. 24 owners have to agree. Now, that doesn't mean that even if 20 owners agree, the team will not necessarily come back to L.A. because as we've seen... Sometimes the teams do whatever they want to do, but it's been so interesting. As you know, I've spent some time with the Raiders, and we've heard rumors from tell everybody on our staff that we're leaving to we're staying another year and we might even play in the same stadium as the 49ers. Okay, so there's so much, there's just so much gossip all over the place. Could those two teams even coexist, first of all? Okay, but the Raiders and the Chargers want to move to L.A. together. How in the world will they play in the same stadium? Bitter rivals like that. I don't think they will. Okay. Um, I mean, if, if, if we're going get, to get down to it, I, I Let's think... Let's do that. I mean, 20 owners. That's a, that's a 24. lot. 24. I know, but you said, I'm just saying 20 is a lot to get on your side. It is. You need 24, so I think it's going to happen for a couple teams. Yes. Um, I don't think the Raiders are going to be that team. Okay. Let but, um, I mean, our old friend from Missouri, Stan Kroenke, yes. he, he has um, some land in Inglewood. And have some money. A little money. Got some money. Yeah, a little cash that you can uh, that you can spend on, on building a stadium. That's right. It's already got the land. The dirt's already being moved around. Yes. I think there's a plan in place. He probably knows something we don't. And um, first of all, the NFL, if they want a team in L.A., which they do, the better stadium proposal is in Inglewood. It is. Now, do you think he would ever share his stadium with another team? Maybe he shares it with the Chargers and or the Raiders or whatever. Yeah. Silent Stan will will talk to another team, and he will let somebody else play in his stadium should the Rams relocate to Los Angeles. You know, yeah, it's interesting you said that. He has been very quiet, Will. You, you know him. Is he a quiet man? He is. I mean, I don't think he's somebody that uh, wants to talk to the media. Probably not. And, and, I mean, he's a very successful businessman. And right. It's it's not something he, feel like he feels like he needs to let the public know about. Right. Um, but he's certainly a, a superb negotiator. Mm -hmm. And he understands that Los Angeles needs a team. St. Louis is not equipped to properly house an NFL team anymore. They just don't have the fan base. They don't have the stadium to do it, and he's pretty much made his mind up that he wants to bring the Rams back to the original home, Los Angeles. Which brings me to kind of another point that the San Diego Chargers' original city is Los Angeles. Yes, it is, isn't it? We tend to forget about that. The Raiders' original city is Oakland. Is Oakland, right. So if everything kind of went back to its traditional nesting place... The, the Rams and the Chargers. The Rams and Chargers Interesting. Is, is my belief that we'll be playing in Inglewood and probably a year. And, and you know, I don't know how true this is, but I did hear that Stan Kroenke had also said that if the if the Chargers ended up coming, he would even consider taking the Rams to San Diego. I haven't heard that. So, there's so many scenarios going on here. All I can say is I hope that we're on a sideline next year or this year, later this year, in LA with an NFL team. I, I hope you're right. There's a lot of rumors going around. A lot. But all you have to do is Look Read the between the lines. Just look at the property in Inglewood. 
Well, and now here's, bulldozers a, out there. here's another thing, though. No. All three of these teams have currently a stadium where they're playing in. Do you know that none of them will have one here for several years? So that means that they have to play somewhere. The Coliseum is the only venue that has said we'll accept you. Dodger Stadium has said no. Angel Stadium said no. And the Rose Bowl said no. Well, they can't play in a baseball stadium. Could they play at Taft High School? Maybe. I, I don't know where they're going. I mean, there's some nice, you know, rec parks where they could draw draw the lines. 20, 30 people? Yeah, I don't know. If, if two teams are accepted and, and voted in and decide to move out to L.A., I think the Rose Bowl will accept one of them. I mean, the Coliseum. We'll see. They said no, but... I guess, like you said, negotiation will come into play, right? NFL team has some leverage. I think so. I think you're right so, about that. So, um, I mean, I don't know. It's it's still early, but we are a couple weeks away from knowing something really important. You know, it, it's really sad to me when the fans are concerned, though, because, you know, like, the Charger fans love their team. They've always loved the Chargers. And it would be very sad to me to see that team taken out of San Diego. You, you know, the Rams, like you said, they sort of belong here. So the, the Chargers have been in San Diego for a very long time now, and the Raiders as well. I mean... You know, the Raider fans in Oakland are very dedicated. Yes. And as you know, I've spent some time up there. Um, the Raiders are in the community a lot, and I had a chance to sit down with the Raiders Foundation to find out all the work they're doing in Oakland. So let's take a look. Let's first talk about the foundation. The Raiders do so many things in the community. We could probably be here for an hour talking <laughs> about it all. Uh, let's start with the foundation. Tell us what they do. Sure. So we actually just started um, this season. It's really been a soft launch for us. Uh, and our hope is really to expand what we've already done in the community. So for a very long time, the Raiders have been giving back in the community and now will be the uh, charitable investment arm. Uh, so we'll be fundraising and then giving that money back out into the community uh, for both youth development and for military programming. Tell us um, the kind of events that the Raiders go to through, through the foundation. Sure. So um, we did, we've did. we been going to a couple of veterans dinners this year. Uh, we also go and do a lot out in the school system. So with schools and with youth development centers, um, we do football clinics. We do financial literacy programming. We do anything that really focuses around this idea of um, youth being assets in their community. From somebody who goes out there and actually gets to see this firsthand, what is it like to see the faces of kids who see football players for the first time? They love it. It is great. I mean, it makes us feel really good because we have this amazing platform to inspire our young people, to inspire our military veterans, to know that people are behind them know that they have a great future ahead of them and when they see the football players or the football staff it just makes them that more invigorated they know that there really is someone in the community who has their backs and wants to see them do well touch upon the first and ten and how you bring kids into the games for the first time sure um, so our first and goal program is this amazing program where we take uh, 368 of our tickets and give them to youth programs whether it's um, through the school district or uh, youth development centers military youth come out we bring them in. We have this program over in the arena where we bring in alumni, speak to them. Uh, I think every time uh, Hall of Famer Willie Brown comes and speaks to them, talks about what it takes to be successful in the classroom, what it takes to be successful outside of school, and how you can really believe in your um, your dreams and focus on your goals and that the Raiders are really behind them. And then they go and they see the game. And so for many of those youth, they live here, um, you know, in our backyard, and they never get to a game. So this is our opportunity to bring them in, give them a really special experience, and then, you know, hope that they uh, carry that on in their community. On a weekly basis, you have so many programs for kids specifically um, that come out to the stadium. Tell us about that. So on a weekly basis, on Mondays is our community days. So that's when our players are out in the community and they, they love it. So we have a record number of player appearances this year. We have over 70 unique player appearances going out. So, you know, a lot of times people think that would be the hardest part of my job, but it's actually the easiest because they realize how important it is to give back to our community. Um, on game days, where we're at right now is actually the Raiders Rookies Kid Zone. We have four kid zones in the Coliseum and outside in Raiderville. So here is an opportunity when maybe the game is a little you know, rough or parents need a break, they can take their kids here and get their faces painted, they can get balloon animals, they can get their uh, photos taken in the photo booth and get to see Raider Rusher while they're here. You know, it's, it's so amazing how much you guys do. I don't think that people realize it. Um, you've been out in the community since day one and how do you keep this all straight? <laughs> <laughs> I would argue um, organized chaos. 
Um, the nice thing is, is we have an organization that's completely behind us from top down. Our owner has made community um, a passion project of his, um, not only with the community relations department, but with the newly formed foundation. Our president um, believes in everything that we're doing. And then we have a new head coach, which is an exciting time for us. Um, but he's totally bought in being a local guy from Hayward. Um, he really encourages the guys to get out there. Team meeting, if the guys are out in the community, he puts a picture up and highlights everyone who's done something. So while they're competitive on the field, they're competitive off the field as well. So we've had a lot of great turnout um, with player appearances. You're going to be a busy girl now getting ready for, for 2016. We are. And, and our focus is really to have a big launch of the Raiders Foundation. So like I said, it's been sort of soft this season. But 2016, we're going to come out loud, let everyone know who we are, what we're doing. Um, so we're excited. We're excited to hit the ground running in 2016 and just think about all the various communities that we can touch. You know, Will, always so much fun to see all the great work that the athletes do with all the different charities and the teams. They make a, a huge part of who they are. Absolutely. The Raiders uh, seem like a bunch of great guys. I'm glad you did that piece. Yeah, it was really, it was, it was a lot of fun. A lot of fun. A lot of fun to be in that stadium, so we'll see what happens with that. Now, the biggest story in the NBA this year, besides one that we're going to get to in a few minutes here in Los Angeles, are the Golden State Warriors, Will. They, they are the most ridiculous team I think I've ever seen in my life. Ridiculous is a perfect word. Isn't it? They're, they're just nonsense. I, I, it's nonsense. I, you can't even believe how good they are, right? I mean, We're blown away. So my big question it's to you... It's making us mad. It's making <laughs> all those basketball fans really mad unless you're a big fan of the team. Yeah, like is there any other team that is that good? No. Okay. And, that just, well, and that'll be the end of our show now. Thank <laughs> you very much. So, Will, they've got two losses. The big question has to be, how many losses will they have this year? If they all stay healthy, I mean, this is the, it's the I'm just going to be cliche. Yes. If the starters stay healthy, especially Harrison Barnes, Steph Curry, Clay Thompson, Draymond Green. If those guys don't miss, individually, one of them misses more than, you know, a few games. Mm -hmm. If that, if they can sustain that, I think they lose like six games. Oh, my word. That Now, what do you know what the lowest total for losses in a season is? We might have to look that up. It would be the Chicago Bulls. They're oh. 70. Two and ten in nineteen ninety six. Seventy two and ten. So that's what they. That's the marker for them, that's, huh? That's why you call me the expert. I do. See, because he knows everything about the NBA for sure. Yeah, Michael Jordan came back in nineteen uh, after his baseball stint. Okay. He came back and set the record. His team, his great Chicago Bull team, set the NBA record, seventy two and ten. And uh, the Warriors are on pace right now here in January They're, to break that. It's it's craziness. And their shooting is impeccable. Obviously, there's three guys who you just can't leave open from. No. 23 feet and beyond. Or, you know, there's a low post game, too, that they... They have it all. They're they're very... I mean, they have me tripped up just, just thinking about how, how good their offensive game is. But but as, as many opponents have said, the Warriors' defense is what really closes out games and what, what wins them a championship. Very true, very true. You can't win all those games without defense, so... And speaking of tripping, Will just about trip trying to get to Steph Curry in the locker room. And since we like to take in, let's listen to what the players had to say. Uh, we finally got stops to stop turning the ball over. Start on me. Um, you know the recipe against the the, the, you know, the Clippers is you can't give them easy points. Whether they shoot well or not, that's what fuels our offense. Easy buckets and transition off the turnovers. And we, you know, the first quarter we, we let it happen. And I think that one little stretch in the fourth quarter um, it goes from three to ten off the turnover. So. Once we started to get good possessions on offense, and then we got stops because we could set our defense and make it tough on them. And <clears throat> we're able to make some shots and run away with it. Well, no, we this team been through a lot of situations. We've been through. We know how to come through at the end. We we never get too high, never get too low. We know that it's a long game. And we got four quarters, so we, they start off five. We're gonna make sure we hit them back, and that's what we did. Oh yeah, we got Chicago Bulls tomorrow. They coming in. We gotta get them. All these wins. We all we all like them, but you can't celebrate that alone. We got back to back, so bought Chicago now. We're gonna celebrate a little bit now, but <laughs> yeah. What makes this team special? It's a family, man. All of us is close. Everybody on the boat, man. Ain't nobody ego bigger than that. Everybody sacrificing whatever role it is on this team, and we got a deep team. So we're just a special group of brothers. Maria, you know a team that I think might give the Warriors a run for their money this year? At least we hope so. Hmm, who would that be, Will? These LA Clippers back here. Yes, I think you're right about that. They, they're they on a 
a roll. Pretty good at win streak. Yeah, they are. Yeah, they've gone on the road. They've uh, they've been at, I mean, they've been everywhere winning games lately. And they are doing it without Blake Griffin, which is kind of amazing to me. We didn't think this would be happening. No. I mean, they've won. They did win eight straight. Right. And um, hopefully beyond by the time this airs. But um, you wouldn't think that they have an eight-game winning streak but, with Blake Griffin. Let's, let's talk about this, because in the beginning of the season, it was a little rocky, and even some of the road games and the home games, for that matter, were we were wondering, like, are the Clippers going to be able to you know, get past the first round of the playoffs, second round of the playoffs, and or win any games at all? Because it was very – something was just missing right there. Now, what that thing was seems to be working in the opposite direction, but without Blake, which is just – so strange. Well, like like you said, to begin this season, I think last year's playoff disappointment was kind of forgotten about because this roster got revamped so right. much. It changed think were, considerably. I think there were nine new players. Yeah, on it was the, a lot on, on the roster, mm-hmm. and players that we really thought were going to change the game. Right. Well, now they are, but I think it was so. I think not only was it tough for Doc to implement these new players. Yes. I think there was a little bit of a hangover from that Houston Rockets series when they got defeated. And now that that's past them, mm-hmm. now that they went through the trials and tribulations of the new players, getting to know them, you know, there has to be a gelling process. And they also hit some a couple three-game losing streaks and right. and had some tough times in November. Well, now we're in January. The gelling's it's completely happened. different. Yeah. Blake's minor injury is, is giving him rest, and he's getting better. And it's actually allowed for these this system to actually start working, where Blake isn't the number one choice on the on the block. He's right. obviously. So obviously plays inside outside, takes a lot of shots a game. It's our it's our best option at, on, on offense, well, but I think it's allowed guys like Paul Pierce and Wes Johnson and Austin Rivers. Even DeAndre is more involved in the game now. Other guys have the ball right. in their hands more. It gives them more confidence, allows them to, you know, go for their strengths. But, but what's your feeling when Blake does come back? He's such, a, such an important part of this team. How do you work him back in and keep this – Symmetry going on. Well, I think the system. Doc. I, I think the system stays the same as far as Doc's concerned, and he, All right. I believe he would say, you know, nothing's going to change as far as the way they play the game. But the other guys, the other four guys that are on the court with Blake, yeah. when he comes back, they're going to be more confident and be able to not think that Bla- they have to rely on Blake Griffin. Right. And that if if if, if he gets double teamed, which he, he will, he for sure will. Right. You have Paul Pierce open in the corner. Yes. You have Austin Rivers, who's confident to penetrate, throw an alley oop. You know, this is a very good team, and we, and we knew this before the season started. Because yeah, a, a talent like Blake Griffin, he's gonna have the ball in his hands a lot of minutes a, lot. a game. Yeah. This just allows these other guys to shine, and I think it's it's obviously working out for him in January. I wonder what it's like for Blake Griffin to sit on the sidelines and sort of watch all this happen. Um, it, it, that's got to be kind of a tough place to be, and he's been there before. Yeah, remember when he got yeah, drafted? Yeah, the first year. Yeah, exactly. Spent 82 games in a suit. Yeah, he, he is. So, uh, but this isn't going to be a long, a long thing. I th- no, I think he'll be back what in a week or so. Maybe even by the time this airs, it's not going to be too much longer. Maybe when the winning streak ends. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe, maybe we just let him get some rest. <laughs> All right. Well, we had a chance to go into the locker room and find out what the players are saying. So let's take a listen. So Blake's been out. I'm sure you're taking some questions about this, but you know it's it's caused this uh, the spacing to change up uh, with the small forwards and the big forwards a little bit. So has that improved the way you're able to be mobile and shoot? Yeah, it, it has. I mean, as far as we have kind of like a formula, you know, when somebody's out, I miss time over the years. Uh, JJ's missed time, Chris has missed time, and Blake's missed time. So DJ's probably been the one constant out of the guys that's been here. So for us, we kind of figure out how we, we play without each other, you know, what works for us, and we try to stick with it. And the good thing about having a team like this is we always have that balance, you know, and, and we got to hold the fort down until he gets back. It's good because we, we have the potential to be a great defensive team when uh, we want to. And uh, we see what – you know, you have to do to, in order to be a contender in a championship team. You got to be able to get stops down the stretch, especially. And uh, when we do that, we're among the greats. But we got to be able to sustain it. We know. I feel, I feel like we're more on a string now. Um, that way, you know, guys like CP, Austin, Pablo, uh, JJ, Jamal, those guys can can pressure a little bit more, knowing that if they get beat, the next guy is going to be there. And if that guy needs help, the next guy is going to be there. And uh, that uh, that helps us out a lot. Now we have to move down the hallway here in the Staples Center and talk about the Lakers season, or as I'm calling it now, the Kobe Bryant farewell tour, because that is what it is. 
Absolutely. I mean, they're not having a great season. Everybody knows that. That's it. Here's the thing about Kobe is if somebody just recently asked me about him. What's he like as a person? I said, you know, I have seen both sides of Kobe. I've seen that kind of really genuine person that I like that works hard. And I've seen the guy who some people don't like. But bottom line is he's played in one uniform his whole career. Yeah. And nobody has played that long in one uniform. I respect him. It's very respectable. I mean, yeah. it's, 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 it's kind of easy to stay in a Laker uniform. Well, living in Los Angeles. and For him, it he, was. He hasn't had a lot of draws to, to leave, a lot of reason to leave, you know. Kobe Bryant, the number one fan vote getter for the NBA All-Star Game. What are your thoughts on that? Not are you surprised? surprised? At all. No. Okay. No, I mean, it's Kobe Bryant, and I think if he wasn't retiring, it'd probably be similar numbers even. Yeah, I think so. Because, right. um, you know, people want to see him, and it's, they do. it's in Toronto, Canada. And so fun there. Love he, Toronto. He's as big a draw outside oh, yeah. of our country, even though it's Toronto is really close to us. He's a bigger draw overseas than, than anywhere. Can you just imagine the media around him at the NBA All-Star Game? I know that when Gino and I were there, when it was in L.A., some of the people, like the LeBrons, were just mobbed. But Kobe will be so mobbed at this game, it will be ridiculous. Yeah, it's going to be tough Crazy. For, for anybody to get a shot of him. Yeah. I mean, you just... The scrums are going to be out of control. It's going to it be will. Never He'll need like five bodyguards around him at all times, I'm sure. Maria, guess what? What? Baseball spring training is one month away. When did that happen? Oh my gosh. Just it now. seems like it just ended. <laughs> Here we are, a month away from spring training. So, what do you think? The Dodgers had a lot of shakeups in the offseason. You know what? There is so much Dodger drama right now, I really don't even know where to start. But Dave Roberts, who we love, 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 is the new Dodger manager. He was the one and only choice as far as I'm concerned. And he is going to make a huge difference with these players, especially players like Yasiel Puig that need somebody to give them a hug. That is Dave Roberts. And he's an amazing guy. If that's all Yasiel needs, then... I think that's what he needs. And we should have a good season next year. I think so. So there's some there's some acquisitions. They have a pitcher um, who's been pitching in Japan for a while. Yes, Kent Maeda. He was just signed. Um, they're taking a lot of flack, though, because they didn't go out there and get a David Price. They let Zach Granke go. They've hired yet another GM in the front office there. So it, it is difficult for all of us to look at it, and we're kind of scratching our heads like, what are we doing here with the Dodgers? Um, so we're hoping that they know more than we do because it's puzzling. Yeah, well, I mean, they got hitters. We've always known that. And they these, do. You know, these young guys that we know can hit, I, I, I think they, they got it all coming together. So I hope Dave Roberts is the answer. It, you know what? I really hope that, that he they, they give him a team that he can work with. Um, you know, it is the guys on the field that play the game, not the GMs and not the, uh, the money ball guys doing all the stats in the front office. These guys have to play the game. It has to translate. So we just have to keep our fingers crossed and hope that these guys can gel together. Yeah. I mean, the Clippers and the Dodgers kind of have the same story lately. They they have these great seasons, great rosters, and then the playoffs. You're right. They kind of come to a, a screeching halt yeah. way too early. Yeah. So hopefully uh, the manager is, yes. is the answer to that. Though. Well, you know what? We're going to pull for Dave because he's just such a great guy. He gets it. He loves being a Dodger. He was so excited to come back. And, of course, I had a chance to sit down with him at his press conference. So let's take a look. I am here with new Dodger manager Dave Roberts. Now, Dave, you and I have a lot of opportunities to talk yeah. over the years. Yes. When you come back with other teams, we talked last season about you maybe doing this for the Padres. Now you're here with the Dodgers. When did this first come about for you? Yeah, you know what? After the season, you kind of reflect, and and obviously with the San Diego Padres, we were disappointed. And then I think that after the uh, the postseason finished up, there were some managing opportunities presenting themselves. And, uh, you know, I went through the Seattle process and, and I learned a lot, got in front of a lot of people and finished short in that, uh, you know, that job opportunity. And then the Dodgers situation presented itself. And as, as we have talked, you know, numerous times that this would be an opportunity of a lifetime. And so, you know, there weren't too many places that I want to kind of uh, go out there and, and court teams and put my name in the hat. But when this opportunity presented itself, this is something that I couldn't pass up. Andrew and Farhan said that you nailed it and you knocked it out of the park during the interview. How was that process for you? It was fun. It was fun. But I think that, you know, through this whole process, I just try to be true to myself. And I think that it's funny is people ask me how much I prepared. And, you know, I'm a National League guy. 
I know the National League West. I play the National League West. I've been coaching here in this division for years. And so I think as far as the X's and O's, that was easy. And I think that, you know, when you present yourself in front of the guys, you just want to be yourself. And if it's a fit, great. And if it's not, that's okay, too. And I think that they just saw my sincerity on me being me. I know you're getting to know the players now, taking some time to do that. What do you think your biggest challenges are right away? Yeah, you know what? I, I don't. I don't know. I, that's my goal is to just go out there and meet players and and build relationships. And uh, you know, you hear things from the other side in the media, and you hear things about certain players. So, I don't. I know that there's going to be challenges. That goes without saying. And there's a learning curve and all that kind of good stuff. But for me, I'm just excited to kind of meet people and kind of deal with whatever challenges present themselves at that point in time. I guess the first order of business is to get a coaching staff together. Are you working on that already? That That's in the works. So I think that we, we got through this day, and there's a lot of energy, a lot of excitement. And uh, now we got to go to work and kind of finalize some things on the coaching staff and continue to call players. And then, uh, you know, right, we're shoot right around the corner from the uh, winter meeting. So I'm going to be heading to Nashville. Well, there will be no time off for Dave Roberts, no off season. Welcome home. It's good to have you back. It's good to be back. Thank you. I love Dave Roberts. That I was, love him. That was really great, Maria. Thank and, he, you. and you actually mentioned that he's a little Lasorda like, you think? He is. I'm not sure he's going to yell at umpires, but he's a hugger. He's going to put his arm around you. You know, Tommy was a rah rah guy. Dave's a rah rah guy. And I think we need more of that in baseball. So, of course, I love that. Well, he's a nice guy, but you got to have somebody that's going to kick some dirt on some umpires sometimes. Well, too. yeah. And, and I think he's also going to yell at guys when that warrants it. He's, you know, he's going to be like that very that tough but loving guy that you just want to run through walls for, you know? I hope so. I hope Best so, Best of luck too. to the Dodgers in 2016. Yeah, we're going to, yeah, yeah, for sure, absolutely. Now, the Angels have been a little quieter. They've got a new GM in Billy Epler, and they have made some moves, but no big splashes yet. Um, I know that they're very happy with their current pitching staff, and they're young. They sort of remind me of the Mets last year. They've got so many great guys like Garrett Richards and Hector Santiago. And, you know, really, they're, those guys are just going to get better and better. So with Albert Pujols and Mike Trout on there, you know, this is not a bad roster at all. Yeah, still got superstars. So yes. all those guys you mentioned, hopefully they pull it together. Maria, it's the, a big thing for you, one of your favorite sports, auto Huge. racing. Yes. 100, 100th running of the Indianapolis 500. Can you believe that? A hundred, it will be the hundredth running it of It seems that like the race. first one was just yesterday. Three years ago. <laughs> yeah. And you know what's really cool is when you see some of the cars from a hundred years ago when it first ran, all the way kind of the progression up till now, it's amazing. It's just going to be such a fascinating event for sure. Yeah, who's your favorite to win it? You know, I, I can't even say because I'll be in so much trouble with the um, with the, all the IndyCar drivers. Yeah, you know too many of them. I do, so I can't even say that, but it will be an amazing, amazing day. I think everybody that is anybody is going to be there because it's going to be such a fun event in Indianapolis this year. That should be I'm very excited. exciting. I, I hope they pour 100-year-old milk all, all over the winter. 100? That, well, that is an excellent idea. I think we have to oh, throw that out there, that's right? That's a good idea. Yeah. 100-year-old milk. That would be so disgusting. Oh, my gosh. But you know what, we'll be talking to the drivers um, in Long Beach before they go to Indy. So lots of IndyCar news, of course, all the way up until that point. All right, that will do it for us. But remember, you can watch Playing the Field 24-7 at playingthefieldtv.com. For Will Lepardis, I'm Maria Sorreo, and we'll see you next time.